National Newspaper Publishers Associations, let it be known. Washington, D.C. was an icon of black political power. Then came gentrification. Washington was nearly half black by the mid 20th century and more than 71% by 1970, a capital city that was also a national icon of local black political power. No longer, as D.C. has skyrocketed in population over the past 20 years, uh, egged on by a renaissance in urban life, it has also seen a sharp outflow of black residents. As a, re as a result, between 2000 and the 2020 U.S. Census, the city's black population dropped from 59 to 41 percent. Today, D.C. has one of the highest rates of displacement in the country. The city that once proudly dubbed itself Chocolate City is no longer majority black. Washington's story is, in a sense, just one instance of a nationwide trend. Nine of the 10 American cities with the largest black populations experienced a decline in black residents over the past two decades. Among them are cities that for decades have had deep connections to black politics and culture, including Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia. But DC is also special. It was the nation's first large city with a majority black population, a milestone it crossed in the late 1950s amid a mass movement of white residents to the suburbs. Today, a good chunk of the city is still black, most notably in Southeast across the Anacostia River, which divides much of black Washington from the rest of the city. But the population overall is now almost evenly split between black and white residents with small but growing Latino and Asian populations. That shift has reverberated in many ways in the city's arts and culture and its street life, most, no most, most notably in Shaw and a handful of other traditional black cultural districts and in the city's politics. Politically, Washington for decades was a city where outside the action on Capitol Hill and the White House, power meant black power with City Hall effectively dominated by the city's black residents. Today, that power base is sharing influence uneasily with the new constituency, political strategists say, and I can't talk this morning, y'all, that is a younger, often more liberal and predominantly white. The city has had an unbroken string of black mayors since it first won self-determination in the early 70s, but in recent years, they have been again, urged on by or changed by coalitions of black and white voters and forced to wrangle with the city council that increasingly represents the interests of well-off non-black professionals. Today, we're going to talk about two major topics. We're going to talk about reparations and statehood for Washington, D.C. And there's no two better individuals to speak to those, about those topics than make it plain, Mark, Tom, uh, Thompson, and of course, the publisher of the Washington Informer, Denise Rolock Barnes. Good morning, uh, Mark, and good morning, Denise. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Stacy. How are it's you? It's good to see you both. And Mark. Denise. And Mark. <laughs> hey, Denise, Denise. First, first and foremost, I, I just want to say uh, congratulations yesterday for folks who, uh, who haven't yet uh, read the Washington Informer or uh, not aware, uh, Denise's uh, parents, she's just a proud daughter. Her yeah. parents um, have uh, had a street named after them in Washington, D.C., and there was a street sign in ceremony. Denise, big congratulations on that. Thank you so very much, Stacey. And, you know, it's interesting. My and Mark knew, you know, my dad and my stepmom, and my dad died in 1994. Uh, he founded the Washington Informer, founded, uh, co-founded United Black Fund, and was, you know, just a, sort of one of the street so soldiers, along with Marion Barry and so many others back in the day. Uh, and then my stepmother, on the other hand, was a member, same way, same way, real fighting advocate, founder of the National Association of Black Women Attorneys, but she was also a member of the city council for 16 years here in Washington, D.C. So, and she died in 2006. So, you know, it took a little work, interestingly enough, and so many folks don't really remember them, I thought, until uh, yesterday's event. And it was really sort of uh, a great honor to hear so many people remember their contributions to the city, but the contributions to the neighborhood. And yeah. that's what was so important. Well, it was Fox Hall Place uh, in Southeast is now Wilhelmina and Calvin, Calvin and Wilhelmina Rolock. Uh, 
place, right? Well, let me say it's not, it will remain Foxhall Place. Uh, it's just that we have a ceremonial street sign now, uh, Wilhelmina and Calvin Rolark Way. But um, yeah, it's not a permanent name change. It's something we were trying to make happen, but right. you know. Well, David Youngblood said, you get. <laughs> Denise David Youngblood says, your parents were great and there is no DC history without Denise's parents. That is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What a tribute. That's true. That's true. And we're going to start this morning uh, with <laughs> reparations. Before we get into DC statehood, Mark well, says, well, hold up. Well, wait a minute, though, Stacey. I want to say something. Yes. About uh, Calvin Rolark and Wilhelmina Rolark, who were, who were mentors of mine. And for those who don't know, and, and I'm not sure if Denise remembers this or not, but Dr. Rolark used to always say, if it is to be, it is up to me. And um, when I was starting out on WOL, he was a frequent guest of mine. Um, the, the we know the how legendary the spelling bee has become. He was always doing things to try to make young people feel uh, to lift their self esteem. And there, at the time, there was so much. You know, one time DC was known as the murder capital of the world, and he was out trying to encourage young people. He one of the stories used to always tell was how he would go into some schools and the young people would say, remember Denise, how they were planning their funerals. Oh, that's right. And, and that, really, that really moved him. Um, but one of the, the last things he did the year he died, one of, the, in the, in the, one of the things he did in that last year, in April of 1994, Dr. Calvin Rolark um, bought me a plane ticket to fly to South Africa to broadcast from the first ever Democratic elections on Kathy Hughes Station, WOL. He bought, he bought that plane ticket and paid for it. I went to South Africa um, and went to the ANC headquarters uh, and was there, I think almost two weeks, uh, registering voters, um, broadcasting. And that was made possible because of Dr. Calvin Rolark. So uh, uh, I know both his impact and Wilhelmina Rolark's impact, they were uh, uh, giants in the community. And, you know, uh, we're, we're, I guess we'll get back into D.C. later, but even some of the D.C. politics um, that happened because, you know, we were all in a, put in a very, very awkward and regrettable position, frankly, uh, uh, because when Marion Barry made his comeback, hmm. he ran against Wilhelmina <coughs> Roblox. Exactly. Uh, Thank you. And... <laughs> And we were all like, wait a minute, man, hold it, bro. This is what I mean, this is real. What are you doing? And, and he moved uh, into the ward, Stacey. He moved yeah, into he the ward so he that did. he could run against her. He did. He, <laughs> he, he did. And I mean, the, the Rolox were, uh, they were hurt by that. They, you know, they didn't show it. They weren't the type of people just to walk around and wear that on their sleeve or maybe even say it out right. loud. But um, it was just unfortunately at the time it was somehow a a bigger thing because malcolm i mean i'm sorry my friend slipped today is malcolm x birthday, happy, birthday. Happy, malcolm x right. day. Uh, happy malcolm x day marion had been the target of the federal government uh and to vindicate himself he needed to run again so he he ran against uh mrs rolark and the rolarks um but it you know it it did not diminish um their stature um, the Black United Fund, you know, did a lot and still continues to do a lot. So, so this is a, a great legacy. And and when we get into DC later, I mean, he was a DC statehood supporter, obviously. Yes, both of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and <laughs> uh, you know, fought hard for the rights of the district and all that. And you know, also bailed me out of jail uh, a lot of times standing up for DC statehood. So, God bless uh, Dr. Ms. Rolock. And I saw that story too, uh, Denise. I wish I could have been there. Um, cause, cause they, all of us should have been there for that, uh, for that, uh, renaming of the street. So congrats. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. You know, yeah. I, it's funny. I'll just say this too, Stacey, I know you want to move on, but, uh, that we I heard a lot of stories like that yesterday. Uh, a young woman who was celebrating because she got her first apartment and my father asked her, well, what about your deposit? Mm. She told her how much it was. And, and he said, well, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay your uh, deposit 
Mm. I'm going to pay your first month's rent and I'm going to give you a thousand dollars because you're going to need furniture, you know, and, and, you know, money to begin to you know, put that place, that house in place, your apartment in place. And I used to watch that all the time <laughs> and say to myself, how come when I ask, I always get no. <laughs> My, my response was, you need to come to work and make some money. That's what you need to do. <laughs> well, so. along those lines, though, <laughs> um, the, uh, Greer put up the first picture. Uh, and, and I've seen this picture before, of, uh, Dr. Rolock, um, But I didn't notice until just now this morning when she put that picture up with him holding the newspaper. Yeah. In the background is none other than Denise herself. It's back, back there, where's the picture? Is that you back there, Denise, with the hat on? No, no, That's that was somebody you. that worked with It looks her. like you with yeah. the hat. No, no, no. Poor, uh, God bless her. So she died, but no, she. That's not me. Oh, okay. I, yeah. So, so it's not you. Okay. I was probably the one who took the picture. You probably took the picture. <laughs> David Youngblood says, "I am not crying. You're <laughs> crying." Austin says, uh, "Austin Cooper says Denise continues this great family legacy in her own right." And Bobby Henry. The one and only Bobby Henry from the West Side Gazette says, my remembrance of Dr. Calvin Rolock was his unapologetically being black and his tone and demeanor when he said what he said. And he said it with emphasis and some other choice words. <laughs> 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 but we all, yeah. if you've been around the informant and I've been with uh, Denise for what, 10 years, more than 10 years now, you've heard that saying, Mark, that you... Uh, so aptly put that Dr. Rolock would say Denise has repeated that. If it is to be, say it. It is up to me. It is up to me. <laughs> 10 words with 20 letters. 10 words. He would always start it with that. 10 words with 20 letters. And of course, he also used another phrase I think we've heard even Reverend Jackson use and so many others. You know, no one can save us for us but us. And if it is to be, it is up to me. And he, he definitely, definitely meant that. You know, we so that was why you started United Black Fund. You know, it was all about self determination. It's all about us looking out for us. You know, putting investments in our own uh, homes, in our own communities, in our own cities. Uh, and you know, late in life, you know, he became an Africanist. It's almost like you know, as we talk about Malcolm X. My dad's birthday was yesterday. You know, Malcolm's birthday's today. I look at our council member, Treyon White, who another Tarian, you know, who has discovered, you know, that that, that we should have close ties to the continent. And, uh, you know, it, it, they see they they have a vision that we, <clears throat> you know, it takes us a while to, to capture and, and embrace. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, I've seen it with so many. And just to even watch, you know, uh, Mark's evolution. Not that he has evolved that much, but you know we <laughs> did know each other back in back in the day when you know folks were fighting for power because you know the the elders held it all, and uh, you know now who do we call? Mark Thompson. <laughs> and Mark has and Mark is what, like omnipresent. We, one, one one minute he's in Tennessee protesting yep. and marching, and the next minute he's down in in Manhattan. Uh, advocating for Jordan Neely, uh, then he's in DC. I don't know where he's at now, and probably <laughs> none of my I'm business. I, I, no, no, I'm in New York right now. <laughs> a, a rare moment, I'm home. We're actually <laughs> going to be rallying for Jordan Neely again today, okay, and then later this evening, celebrating um, Malcolm X's birthday with uh, the family at the Shabazz Center, where Spike Lee will be the keynote speaker. Um, and and we lift up, I'm not there obviously, but there's all there's still for the past. 50 some odd years, there's been a pilgrimage to Fern Cliff Cemetery on this day mm. to go to Malcolm's gravesite and there are a number of people who are gathering at this moment in Harlem to take the buses up there. So Godspeed uh, to them on this uh, on this sacred day. Well, uh, and thanks for all of this. That is, I think it was a fantastic way to start off our Friday um, because uh, yesterday was a very special day. Uh, for Denise and her family and for the entire Washington Informer community, the black press. And, you know, let's not just limit it to the black press. What happened yesterday, because Dr. Rolock obviously was a big part of the black press as well, um, was, was a testament to what black newspaper owners have been able to accomplish despite all types of adversity, sometimes unspeakable 
adversity. And sometimes the adversity comes from within as well. Right. Um, so that oh, is yeah. a huge deal. And Mark, you're 100% right. Um, unfortunately, even even though I, I, I do work for Denise, <laughs> I did not hear of it until yesterday. So <laughs> I did not know. Otherwise, I think it would have been appropriate to, to make sure that we all made um, our way down there uh, for that particular um, in, that, that, that dedication. Uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, and I think all of our newspapers across the spectrum, 230 plus uh, African-American papers should be honoring uh, Calvin Rolock and um, and Denise and, and the Washington Informer. Uh, what an account! I don't care what city you li you you live in, you're from. You get uh, an honorary street uh, sign, no matter if it's permanent or temporary. It's a big deal. So congratulations, Denise. As we uh, move into uh, reparations, Mark, uh, and 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 no better p person to talk about this, Mark. Uh, a group of lawmakers, as you know, they're starting to step up to boost the reparation efforts that would benefit descendants of enslaved Africans. On Wednesday, uh, Corey Bush from uh, Missouri, Barbara Lee from California, Rashid, Rashida Tlaib uh, from Michigan um, stood in front of the Capitol as they unveiled, uh, quote unquote, reparations now, a resolution that urges the federal government to take action to compensate the descendants of slaves. The measure is meant to bring attention back to H.R. 40, the slow moving federal bill that has been introduced to Congress each term since 1989 and will create a commission to examine the issue. Mark, um, takeaways from uh, Corey Bush and, and, and the others, uh, what they said um, at the press conference and this idea um, that H.R. 40 just is stuck, perennially stuck. No, it wasn't, though. We had 215 committed votes last year. Mm -hmm. um, and we needed just one or two more to pass the House. We had those votes. And we know the Speaker was going to vote for it. We had those votes. Some were co-sponsors. Some were committed yes votes. Even we were challenged to get moderate Democrats on the bill, like Connor Lamb. On the bill. They agreed to vote for it. Why? Because just coming out of the reckoning, some of those white moderate Democrats needed to go back and campaign saying, I'm on the reparations bill. Mm. So the hard work of Encobra, our legacy um, uh, reparations organization, and its legislative director, Kenneth Henry, they had, they had whipped those votes. The party leadership decided that it was too controversial during the midterms to pass H.R. 40. So it was not stalled last year. It was sabotaged. And th the problem was, you know, you don't get that opportunity much. You got 215 votes for reparations. Well, it, and to be clear, folks, it was for the commission to study yes. reparations, plural proposals. All right. It's and, similar and, to California, right? Um, that, that, that they formed that commission, and they have, you know, next month they're going to present their findings to the. Now, one going to like California because California got overtaken and sabotaged by uh, ADOS. Now, California is writing its way. Um, it's you know, it's, it, the situation is getting better, but um, at a moment when the movement had been infiltrated um, by those who were using the issue to divide us the same group of people that wants to change the census to separate different categories of black people, right? Uh, pick the category that says you are an American descendant of slaves versus being African-American. So let's divide us. The HR 40 legislation, unlike the battle in California, um, dealt with vestiges of slavery. So, so part of the ADOS argument is that we should only talk about things before 1865. H.R. 40 and the piece of legislation that Cory Bush introduced Wednesday um, deals with slavery and its evil offspring, all of the vestiges of slavery, Jim Crow, the loss of voting rights, mass incarceration, police violence, segregation, lynchings, on and on and on and on and on. And the problem with that is when you start uh, uh, focusing on only people who can prove that they're a direct descendant of an enslaved ancestor, most of us can't prove that because there's no documentation of that. That was the purpose of, <laughs> of enslavement, to break us, 
Dr. John Henry Clark said that enslavement's greatest crime was the loss of our ancestral memory. So some with some who want to minimize the argument and confine it to a certain number of people uh, and not deal with the vestiges. The NYPD killed when they killed Abu Diallo, they didn't ask him if he was a descendant of slave. And, and first of all, uh, uh, there were no such thing. We weren't Americans yet. So we couldn't be an American descendant of anything because, uh, first of all, America didn't even exist when we were first in, enslaved. So. We are at a place now where we do language, quite frankly, because Democrats don't control the House anymore. And I'm going to tie this to D.C. statehood. If the Democrats would go ahead, they had the votes last time, last session, too, mm -hmm. to admit D.C. as the 51st state <laughs> and Puerto Rico as the 52nd state, they'd have practically a permanent majority. They could pass reparations. They could do all of that. They can get everything passed. Joe Manchin wouldn't even matter. So, they, you know, the Democrats just don't always make intelligent decisions. And so that's why we where we are. Congratulations to uh, Cori Bush. Her bill supports H.R. 40, as well as the Truth and Transformation Bill that Barbara Lee has written. Uh, however, Cori Bush puts a dollar figure on it, $14 trillion. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at a minimum when yeah. it comes to to that level of compensation and so that, so, that was oh i'm sorry go ahead mark go ahead and complete your no, no no that's it so so that that is that is the 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 real um uh, uh defining characteristic or feature the highlight of her piece of legislation that it would <laughs> that it puts that 14 trillion there. and some folks are scared of that reparations right. to some mainstream politicians is still the third rail and we'll talk about it but uh, uh, Malcolm X talked about it. Dr. King talked about it. We've come to uh, uh, claim a check that has been marked insufficient funds, but everybody wants to teach us all he said was, I have a dream. He said that at the beginning of the speech, talked about reparations. So this is uh, an issue whose time has come, whether the Democratic Party um, has decided to embrace it or not. And I'm not saying, you know, some would say, the ADOS group says, well, you know, don't vote, but they're, what they're demanding is not what the reparations movement over time has been demanding. One, we can't afford not to vote, but I think we have to say to the, to the party, if we are giving you our votes and putting you all in office, you've got to see to it that this, that this happens. And this is, a, this is a moment whose time has come. Joe Biden, we didn't, we didn't ask Joe Biden to say black community, uh, had my back. Now it's my time to have yours. Well, come on, get our back then. <laughs> but you know, if I can just jump in, yes. Stacey and, and Mark, I, one of the things that when you talk about the Black press, I think this is a pivotal role for us right now because, um, you know, we, the, the, the phrase reparations is a phrase for, for a lot of people. Uh, once you explain it to them, like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, these white folks did, blah, you know, and I deserve but what does the bill actually say? And what would, if there was a way, and there is a way that we as the black press could actually, uh, with the help of others, dissect that bill. Um, I mean, publish it, show what it, what it would mean, you know, have some interpretation of it so that we're doing a, a national public education around some legislation that we could get voters to rally behind so it doesn't look like it's just, you know, a few Congress people up on the Hill and, and a couple of uh, local uh, council members that see where they were there as well. But, you know, to build momentum is the same thing with statehood, you know, in the district. People like the concept, but they're they're not wrapping their arms around it wholesale because they don't understand it. They don't know what, it, what it's going to mean for them. Uh, and I think statehood, I mean, when it comes to reparations, people think money, you know, uh, Mark mentioned that. But I think it's a little bit more than that. So, you know, we could find a way in, in, in our black newspapers to actually take this on as an educational uh, initiative uh, to get more conversation around it besides, uh, in addition to, you know, the folks who've been in the forefront leading this effort. This is just kind of how I feel well, uh, that folks need to know. Well, Bobby Henry is, um, and I'm sure I have the license to say this, he's running for chair of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. He's watching right now. It might be an issue that Bobby um, can, if uh, he's elected, 
uh, to chair. Maybe he can spearhead that. Um, someone has to take the lead, right? Exactly. And, um, exactly. It, it, it might be something that, it, not to put Bobby on the spot, but he, but uh, it's it's a serious issue, right? And we can we put Bobby see, on the spot. Let's put Bobby on the spot. <laughs> Let's put him on the spot, Mark says. His, his hey, daddy Bobby. needs a street name too, so you know. That's right. <laughs> Good morning, Bobby. <laughs> and so, so, yeah. so when you when you uh, you know what you what you're saying is is so right. Um, we we do have we have that um, charge. Uh, we've always had the charge. The black press has always had that charge, right? To to make sure that these things are out there and and the unvarnished uh, truth of of things. And uh, Mark knows it. He he talks about it every day. He's out uh, on the front lines every day. Uh, it, we have a responsibility, Mark. Yeah, no, you, 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 you're absolutely right. And we just have to continue to to keep this fight alive, keep it going. Um, I think more people are aware of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Denise is right. Um, you know, some of the confusion on social media about some of the groups I was saying, you know, give us a check, give us a check. But see, the thing about that is we need investment to build wealth in our communities as well. In addition to whatever check people, because let me tell you something right now, you give everybody just a check. Right. You give every black person even $10,000. Let's just say that. Okay, Eric, Everybody a got a check for uh, COVID. What, but, not that, <laughs> but, but not only that, Denise, folks still haven't recovered from that. So exactly. if you give everybody $10,000, <laughs> folks are still catching up. That money is going to recycle right back in the white economy. So, so Mark, the, let me... The let white me, middle class got... They didn't wake up rich right. and wealthy. They had the Homestead Act. They had FHA loans. They had Social Security. They had the GI Bill mm -hmm. to build their wealth. And wealth we know in America, middle class wealth, is based upon home ownership, land ownership. We didn't get that. So right. we need the same investment in, in, in that as well. And as far as, you know, the argument, well, people from Africa don't deserve it or people from the Caribbean. Um, anybody here who suffers under vestige of slavery, like I said, they don't ask you whether you're from mm -hmm. Brooklyn or Haiti or Ethiopia, like they did Amadou Diallo. Not to mention the fact, let me let y'all know a little something. You know, many of us who, who have enslaved ancestors, those ancestors were first sent to the Caribbean and broken there. Right. So there's no such thing as, you know, just I'm an American. Af mm -hmm. I'm an American African. We are African Americans. And we need not let these things divide us. So that's well, Smokey all Robinson says he's American American. Who said that? <laughs> Smokey Robinson. So, when so that? Smokey says that he doesn't want to be called African American. He said he's an American. He's just as American as the white guy. He's American American. He said he's, he's when, American. When did he say that? He said it last week. Uh, we did a whole thing on that uh, on the program. He said it last year as well. He doubled down on it, and he gave his reasons. You know, and I, I'm not hating on his reasons either. You have to go listen to uh, what he said. Um, but his, you, I, so that's like you can't reason with that. That's like me coming on here saying uh, I'm a I'm a kitten. I'm not a kitten. <laughs> and Malcolm said that you can't put kittens in the oven and come out with biscuits. We are <laughs> African people. God bless Malcolm. So we are African people. That's where we came from. We were stolen. This was not in some natural immigration. I'm an American American. What is that? Well, here's the thing, Mark. Let me ask you this. Um, White folks ain't real Americans. They stole this land. From well, that, that, and that was part of Smokey's point. I keep point. telling Denise, don't be calling me early in the morning to put me on this show and then I <laughs> start talking to me. Y'all just send me on home. I got, uh, you know. I got, I got. Mark, Mark, let me, let, let me, let me ask you. you have, I'm, I'm guessing you saw and, and uh, are up to speed on San Francisco's proposal, right? What the commission there in San Francisco put together. And I think it goes along to what, what you're saying. What they are asking for is not only uh, financial reparations, but they're asking sure. that, um, that their certain amount or, or whomever who's, who falls under um, as a recipient receive um, uh, housing, right? But also receive education, financial education, and their monies uh, right. to go into a black bank. Right. Uh, it's a lot of components there that it sounds like what you are saying is more than just money. And that's, yeah. that is the key, right? Um, it, you don't right. want to just give a check. 
Yeah, it's more it's more than just um, um, an individual check. And that's where, what Denise is saying is important for people to really be educated right. about right. what's going on. Um, and, and let's face it. I mean, white folks weren't educated when they got all the help they got. But with the help they got, it was hard for them to go in the wrong direction because the help was given for the purpose of building their wealth and yep. establishing them as the middle class. And so, you that know, this 40 not, acres in a mule would have been a right, whole right. lot cheaper than the price tags they're talking about today, that's right? That's exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. Exactly. And, and frankly, the whole economy. See, this economy isn't great. I mean, it's doing it's bounced back from COVID, we know. But I mean, frankly, and I think Bishop Barber would make this argument. Um, uh, um, what created the middle class has run out. Mm -hmm. So we're behind. Uh, in terms of two cycles as African-Americans, we're behind the first cycle to build the white middle class. And now what helped build the white middle class is obsolete because we really don't have middle class anymore. Everybody's working class in America. Everybody is probably in most two to three paychecks away from what Jordan Neely was homelessness. Right. That's not a real middle class anymore. So do you need something else for this, this current middle class? Black folk didn't get nothing from the first middle class wave. And now here's we had a second middle class wave. And we haven't gotten anything from that. So this has to happen twice. So and, I'm sorry. No, that's go okay. So let's 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 go ahead, uh, Denise and Mark. Um, it, it's, it's a great tie into statehood, right? Uh, right? We know what two years ago, and I spoke to Eleanor Holmes Norton, the delegate from, from uh, DC. Um, they passed the legislation that would eventually, um, if approved by the Senate and signed by the president, make DC the 51st state. Um, they passed it. Um, Eleanor was uh, so she was as enthusiastic in 2021 as she had ever been. And then it yeah. died. Um, and I think you've already done a phenomenal job of tying the, the two topics, reparations with um, uh, statehood for D.C. You talked about statehood for Puerto Rico. Um, Denise, at some point in D.C., it has to be a little bit demoralizing because you know, we throw that phrase out there, taxation, taxation without representation. You live it. D.C. residents live it. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, we do. But, but, you know, it's what can I say, Stacey? It's, it's almost as uh, there's still a, there's a movement. There's a very, very strong movement for statehood in the District of Columbia. It is, a, is there a wholesale uh, support around it? Uh, you know, D.C. has a lot of transients. And it takes people that come to the city from other places. My dad, actually, that's that's why this thing became so strong way back in you know in the early '60s, probably before that. Yes. But when Marion Barry and all and my dad and other folks came to D.C. from states where they, you know, had been disenfranchised, got the right to vote, and then came to the District of Columbia and found out that they could not vote for anything. They yeah. couldn't vote for president. We didn't have a locally elected government. We didn't have anything that we could. Uh, uh, that could, would show that we had support or at least control of our own resources, although we were all taxpaying citizens. So yeah, it, it becomes somewhat demoralizing, um, uh, but I, I think there's also been a growing effort to engage more district residents. And the focus is not so much on the district, it's more focused on the folks that have to who support this on the hill the people in congress to to educate people in their communities about what's happening in the district of columbia but you know it's almost like we've grown these scabs you know that um uh they don't really get ripped off because you know when something happens it's like well it's still there you know and and some people don't even have a lot of great expectation around uh a votehood um, a statehood vote you know for dc so I, I don't, I think it's demoralizing more so, of course, to those who are putting a lot of time and effort into this. It's right. demoralizing when it comes to uh, legislation on the Hill uh, that we can't, um, uh, you know, have a say on. It come, becomes demoralizing when you've got uh, a, a Republican um, Congress that decides to knock down our district laws and people don't realize how important that is until a law goes to the Hill. Everything that bill to name a street after my father had to be approved by Congress. Mm -hmm. It yeah. had to be approved by Congress. So th and that, that happens nowhere else in the United States of America. 
The yeah. only national capital in the world with no representation in the national legislature in the world. Countries that this United States government would call even third world or underdeveloped nations don't do that. It this is all about built, power. This, this nation was built on tax rates. Well, but it goes back to what you were saying earlier. D.C. was chocolate city. Yep. And it want D.C. to be a state. It, it's, it's not only demoralizing, it is dumb and illogical. It is only, frankly, in the Democrats' best interest for D.C. to be a state. It, every day Joe Biden's, oh, what's uh, Joe Manchin going to do to me today? Well, if D.C. were a state, you wouldn't have to worry about Joe Manchin anymore. Mm -hmm. And Joe Manchin would probably, if he was smart, he'd be relieved because then he could just swing from the chandelier. It wouldn't make a difference. He's doing, he's playing to his base in West Virginia. So set him up. Go, he needs to keep doing that fine. Let him do it. But he would be offset with two senators from D.C. and then, frankly, mm -hmm. two senators from um, <laughs> from Puerto Rico. So no advocates of statehood, um, they they say that the real power grab took place uh, long ago by wealthy white elites in Congress who actually disenfranchised the entire city rather than allow black people access to political power. They say it's uh, no mere conjecture. It is all in the historical records um, as the movement for D.C. statehood gained undeniable momentum. Anxious cries from its detractors reached a fever pitch following the uh, House's approval of uh, the Washington, D.C. Emissions Act or H.R. 51, which would finally grant statehood and full voting representation in Congress. Critics emerged everywhere, Mark and Denise, of course. Uh, they uh, talked about a partisan advantage that statehood would bring, and they argued that D.C. statehood can only spring from a constitutional amendment. And focus, they focused on the potential partisan leaning of the new state's federal delegation, and that all missed the point, because D.C. statehood would correct an overt act of racial voter suppression with roots in the Reconstruction era. Because you know, um, in 1867, it was Andrew Johnson vetoed a bill granting adult citizens of the district, including black men, the right to vote. And Congress overrode the veto, granting significant political influence to black Washingtonians. But as soon as they started to vote and exercise their power, Congress replaced D.C.'s territorial government with three presidentially appointed commissioners. And the goal was uh, to move, uh, uh, you know, that was a move to to the obvious, disenfranchising an increasingly political, active black community. So I, I, I respectfully disagree um, <laughs> with with that. I mean, it's true. People came out of the woodwork. But I'm just say this. Um, Denise and I have been involved in this issue for years. Mm -hmm. And the, when the bill passed the House. Because the Democrats were in power. See, we there have been fights against D.C. statehood for years. Going back to the 1800s. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. Look, look, but, but, Senator but, but, John Tyler Morgan, he yeah. said the Negroes came into this district and it became necessary to deny the right of suffrage entirely to every human right. being. And as he put it, he said it was necessary to burn down the barn to get rid of the rats. But but see, but but that's not what happened when it passed the House this time. Um, the, the 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 Democrats in the Senate didn't go forward. Uh, they had the votes mm -hmm. and everybody knew it. So people made noise and they complained like they always did, but it was like a broken record and it didn't have the same impact. So this could have been done and it should have been done. You know, what, what, one day in history that I will never forget is when Newt Gingrich became the speaker, uh, was it the speaker of the, the house? Yes. And uh, Congressman Norton invited all of Washington to Eastern High School to hear Newt Gingrich speak to the District of Columbia. He was gonna be our friend and our champion on the Hill. And at the time she had a vote in committee, right? She couldn't vote on the floor, but she had a vote in committee. And right after that event where they stood on that stage hand in hand and he waved at the audience of DC residents and we sat there suspiciously looking at him and saying, what is Eleanor doing? He goes back to the Hill and takes her vote away. Mm -hmm. Where's the trust? You know what I'm yeah. saying? And we've seen, that's what's demoralizing. You know, when we see these acts 
and we're out here, you know, I mean, what, what else did we do, Mark? We brought in Reverend Jesse Jackson. He came to District of Columbia, bought a house, ran for shadow senator, said, maybe I can help to get this national attention around that. Spent nights in, in, in uh, uh, dilapidated public housing. I mean, this was before he ran for president, you know, thinking that he could help. He couldn't. Um, and so it's things like that when we know how much people are investing time and energy into this effort. And you're right. I mean, it boils down to racism. That's what it does for most of us. And that's what makes it so demoralizing. Yeah. yeah. And 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 Mark, um, before we um, wrap up, because we, we, we know that we are running out of time quick. Um, Tie it up for us, Mark. Um, we know that, uh, as Denise said, racism plays a role here, obviously a big role. And um, this this idea that D.C. just cannot have representation is just it's absurd. But tie it up for us. Well, I, I think, again, we 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 tie it up with the understanding that what's happening in D.C. is also happening to a lot of our other cities and that we as African-Americans are just, you know, um, um, pieces on the chessboard. Um, we started electing black mayors and Marion Barry was in the generation of, of strong black mayors being elected in many of our cities coming out of the civil rights movement. White flight was taking place into the suburbs. Now white folks have decided they're going to come back to the cities. And that's why you see a lot of these changes. So the cities are gentrifying. So, okay, they'll do this. So what, in 30 years from now, they're going to decide to go back out. And then so, but, but see, they're making decisions and we're not. They're making decisions that impact us and we're not at the table making those decisions. And that is why, you know, our organizing as a people, our unity as a people is very, very important uh, in all of these matters. I mean, I, re I remember uh, I, I was the last candidate in Washington, D.C., running for the Moja Party, uh, the last black political party in the nation that had ballot status. We had ballot status in Washington, D.C. I was the last person standing between, as a candidate, D.C. City Council remaining majority black and remaining and, and becoming majority white. And, and I mean, when I did that, they took me out. The Washington Post, who, which really, because people need to understand in D.C., and this is a long conversation, they only have Congresses as overseers, but there's a, the elected city council and there's something called the federal city council which the Washington Post um, was in charge of. And they made all the decisions every day about what was gonna go down and what was not gonna go down in Washington, D.C. So this has been um, this has been a long struggle. Ironically, we talk about the Justins in Tennessee. Jesse Jackson came to D.C. to run for shadow senator because that was under the Tennessee plan. Uh, um, the Tennessee plan, which was in instituted before, the, before 1800, said that um, a state looking to I mean, a, 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 an area looking to become a state, looking to become a state, needed to elect two shadow senators to lobby for that. That's what D.C. did. Uh, Jesse Jackson and Florence Pendleton were our first two shadow senators. Um, and we did paid all that price, did all I, I did a month in jail for D.C. statehood. <laughs> and and yet, um, you know, here we are. And then when we got the first ever vote and it passed, we, we should have seen it through. And I'm not sure yet. The Democrats will probably win back the House. It's going to be tough to hold the Senate this time because the demographics uh, shift. What we do have in our favor, though, um, is some of the other issues that are galvanizing other Americans, be they uh, Roe, um, be they issues of, of, of CRT and, and this gun stuff, this gun violence. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say on that is that when D.C. was called the murder capital of the world, people looked down their noses, didn't care. And I said then, all you white folks better understand that what's happening in D.C., you're going to be next. And I wasn't saying it because I was wishing it on everyone. Mm -hmm. But now look what's happened. Um, um, it's gun violence in black and white communities. It was a little bit different. Gun violence is on the streets in the black community, gun violence, mass gun violence is in the schools and in the grocery stores and in the churches in the white community. So at some point, Americans must understand that we're all the same. We're all in the same struggle. 
we're suffering under the same systems. Um, there is no more excelling white middle class. African Americans are just trying to catch up. That's why y'all shouldn't hate on reparations. The rights, a woman's bodily autonomy is found in the amendment that allegedly freed us in the 13th amendment. So people, the, the second amendment, Professor Carl Bogus's book is out, folks. That's your homework assignment. The Hidden History of the Second Amendment, Professor Carl T. Bogus. Second Amendment was written so that Patrick Henry, George Mason, and others could keep their guns and organize militias to stop our enslaved ancestors' insurrections. It wasn't about the Revolutionary War. That is a fact. So, so I want people to think about that. Everything that's happening now, every issue we're trying to deal with still has its roots in America's sin, that is the period of enslavement. And the sooner people can understand that, the sooner we can all come together and turn this whole thing around. Well, I wanna you, just say, if I really, mm -hmm. and this is for another conversation, I'd love to get uh, Mark's uh, perspective on this as well, but the new dynamic, you know, looking at the border and the impact of, um, you know, this mass movement of new, immigrants, I guess, into the United States that are flowing into our communities, you know, uh, that will have influence over um, measures within our communities. What does that mean? You know, and it's something that we can't, I think, put a blind eye towards because it's either going to be a population that will support what we do, or it'll be a population that'll support what they do. <laughs> so we've got to be focused on that as well. No, I do yeah, think that, and, is, that is another conversation. I'll just say quickly that that here's here's part of the problem. Um, you have white people controlling this government who are the real immigrants. The people who are coming in, uh, especially from south of the border, were the original people here in North America. That's that's a, a paradox and an irony right there. But what they're fleeing from, you know, in terms of their context is worse than what's going on here. And that's the challenge, trying to help, help people understand. We all coming in here, uh, you need to support us. We need to support each other. Rather than some of you all thinking, well, it's actually not that bad here because it's not as bad as it was where we were. It's, it was bad where you were because of American foreign policy. So still, you got to fight for justice and reform wherever you are. Yeah, well, it, I think um, sometimes the most uh, complicated uh, argument can be really simplified. And Denise, I think you simplified the argument for statehood this way by saying for a street sign, a temporary street sign. That's right. It's, it's go, permanent, but it's 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 uh, ceremonial. It's not ceremonial. A, right. You, mm -hmm. you need to go through the U.S. Congress. Right. That is absurd on its face. That is absurd. Um, we will continue to talk about statehood. We'll continue to talk about reparations next month. Um, we will see what the uh, California uh, lawmakers do as they get the report. They get the recommendations, I should say, from that commission out there. And um, we'll continue to watch as uh, Representative Cory Bush and others lead the fight nationally. Thanks so much for Mark. Make it plain, Thompson. Thank you, Denise uh, Rolock Barnes, the publisher of the Washington Informer. Go to WashingtonInformer.com for the latest news about the district and nationally. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.